season. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm Ken Pekrowski. I'm the chair of the Les Paul Committee. I'm also a volunteer and a trustee at the Mawa Museum. I want to thank everybody for um, tuning in. Uh, and tonight's conversation <laughs> is going to focus on the uh, on Les, Les Paul's uh, recording innovations. And we have three guests who have uh, three very special guests who have uh, firsthand and intimate knowledge of uh, Les's uh, recording techniques. So if I could just uh, bear with me and I will, uh, I'd like to do a, a brief introduction to uh, each guest. First, of course, is Jean, Jean Paul, who is, um, uh, who is Les's uh, son. And Jean is a recording, mixing, mastering engineer, producer, and musician. He was an engineer at Atlantic Recording Studios during their famed 1960s to 80s period and is currently chief mastering engineer at G&J Audio, a mixing and mastering studio for major and independent labels focused on reissues and new recordings. He has worked on thousands of projects and has engineered nine Grammy award-winning albums with 29 total nominations in 15 different categories. He has engineered many hit recordings, including seven number ones on the pop board, pop board, pop and jazz charts, six more in the pop top 10 and 10 more in the jazz top 10 and five in the R&B top 20. And in addition, Gene has put together a really loving tribute to his father, Les Paul Remembered, and the uh, URL on that is uh, lespaulremembered.com, I think it is. That's it. All right. Uh, and we also have Sean, Sean McClary. Sean is currently the Associate Professor of Music, of music Industry at the College of St. Rose, teaching courses in radio production, analog recording, songwriting, and composition, music business, and double bass. Sean is active as a music producer, composer, songwriter, and performing artist in both popular in both the popular and classical worlds. Uh, Sean specializes in historic methods of recording and music production. Sean's area of research is Les Paul and Mary Ford, their groundbreaking recordings and technical advan advancements as recording artists. Sean spends a lot of time restoring and using vintage recording equipment including record cutters and Ampex reel-to-reel -reel tape machines. We have, and that lastly, we have Frank Rush. Frank was with Ampex Corporation who made the commercial audio tape recorder a reality following World War II. Based on the captured German magnetophone, the first Ampex Model 200 recorder reproducer was made and delivered to Bing Crosby Enterprises. It was this connection that allowed Les to experiment with sound on sound. And eventually, the friendship between Les and Paul, along with Lou Paolo, who was part of the Les Paul trio. Frank was in New York during what was known as the multi track explosion. Eight track recorders had been around, but the recording industry was looking for more, and the Ampex 16 track was introduced at the 1969 AES exhibition in New York. During these exciting times, Les and Frank met with eventually, which would eventually lead to a long-term friendship. Frank supported Les at the local level while he interfaced with Ampex Engineering in Redwood City, California with his ideas. And joining tonight is uh, Charlie Carreras, um, who is the Professor Emeritus of History at Ramapo College and Vice President of the Mawa Museum. So I guess my first question uh, to you, Jean, is um, what was the spark that got your father's interest in sound recording? Wow. Uh, I would have to say that uh, the, the reason for all of it was his lust to entertain and play the guitar. Uh, that's what to me, the whole journey was about. And as a child, uh, he had certain markers that motivated these things. Uh, one of the first ones was his piano teacher, 
that he went to. And after a few lessons, uh, the piano teacher sent him home and uh, he was told that he was never going to be involved in music and don't send him back is what he gave the message to his mother. Well, that didn't turn out quite the way the teacher thought. <laughs> and that was, that was probably the start of all the other excuses that came along. The second one was at the barbecue stand where he entertained there as a young boy and entertaining he finished and he thought he was doing well and some fella sent back a message saying your voice sounded great the harmonica sounded great however I couldn't hear your guitar well we all know where that went <laughs> and then the one that has to do with tonight I think is the one that his mother came down to Chicago to see him and had mentioned to him how great he sounded last night on the radio. And he looked at her and said, Ma, I wasn't on last night. I was on the stage with the Andrews sisters, so on and so forth. And she said, well, you better do something about that because you're beginning to sound like everybody else. That was the motivation to your topic tonight. And he figured out that he had to go back home, California, and do something about this. Now, each one of these keys really registered with this guy. He, as much as he had all these other things going for him, he was really a listener. He would really listen to people. This one stuck, and he went back to California, but not without part of his dream, which was to work with Bing Crosby. He never met Bing, and he just knew how much he admired him. And he went back there, and it's another night for the story of how he got together with Bing. But he got together with Bing. And in doing so, he ended up on the record long, long time with Bing. And he finished the record. And by that time, Bing and Dad were good musical friends. But more than that, they become very good friends where Bing knew Dad's interest in sound. And he was trying to get dad to open up a studio. He was going to buy a building and let dad run it and put together a studio. And dad always looked at those kind of ventures as it would pull him away from music, from entertaining and whatever. So he didn't accept it. So he went home and his two buddies were there and they asked the question, how did you do with the record, how was the, how did it go? And he said, it went great. It's probably gonna be a hit and a, very successful. And they asked him, how, how come you took so long? And he said, well, Bing, and he told them the story. And the fellas were as crazy as dad was because when dad sent something, they wanted to add to that and help out. And through that, they came up with the idea of building a studio in the garage. And after a little chat with that, figuring out what equipment, what it would cost, everything else, and they would build the place, they went ahead and did it. And when they put the studio together, it was very interesting because Dan and I had several conversations about that particular studio. And part of his explanation was, you got to know your equipment and keep the line simple, clean. And what he meant by that was microphone, mixer, cutting lathe. That was what he started with. Nothing in between. 
if you want to EQ something, change the mic, change the atmosphere in the room, but that's it. So that's where he was going with the studio. Now, for the uh, for the inter for the real puzzling part, which was the part where he got after a year's time, he got to figuring out that he could he should do the parts with his sound. There was something happening where he started to experiment layering his guitars on top of things. And again, anybody that came to the house, if they had any inclination of music, they were in the studio. So he constantly was recording. He was recording Bing there, he recorded everybody. And that's where he experimented on miking. And he experimented on getting his confidence together to try some multiple things himself. And that's where it started. Now, Sean has been doing quite a bit of research on it. And can we throw it over to Sean to pick up on the interplay with the uh, yeah. disc? Yeah, and before we, we turn it over to Sean, I just forgot to mention at the top of my remarks that uh, your audios are on, so if you want to ask any questions of Gene, Frank, or Sean, feel free to do that. So uh, you don't need to use the Q&A, just, you know, uh, shut out your questions uh, when it comes time. Go ahead, Sean. Um, so, yeah, I'll share with you a little bit of uh, research that I had done over the past, I guess, couple of years. Um, for just a little bit of background, um, Ken mentioned that I'm a professor up at a, a college in Albany, New York, the College of St. Rose. And um, at St. Rose, we have sort of returned to analog. Um, and one of the reasons we did that is for the purpose of teaching about Les Paul and getting our students to use the equipment and do the same sort of processes that he had championed. So we have several Ampex tape machines, some that are completely restored, some that are in the process of being restored. We've got a record cutter. Um, and, uh, and for me, I was doing research this past year in preparation for a book that I'm writing also about um, the technical achievements um, of that music between uh, Les and, and Mary Ford, um, which started off as a manageable idea. And the more I dig into less as a subject it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> um so last year i had an opportunity to take a sabbatical from for a semester for my teaching and i spent the semester traveling around the country to different parts um for research for this book so i spent some time in uh uh in Waukesha, wisconsin where uh, les was born um spent some time in mawa um at the house um and uh, then also in California, Southern California particularly, um, but then also up in Silicon Valley in, in Southern California where um, the house was and Capitol Records was. Uh, I spent some time at Capitol Records meeting with the archivist there. Um, and uh, I went to the house, which is no longer there. Um, it's a parking lot now. Um, and then up, went up the coast to, uh, the Silicon Valley where um, at Stanford University where the Ampex archives are and spent several days researching there at the Ampex archives. Um, so what we're talking about here is uh, the music that was made at the house at 1514 North Kirsten Avenue in the garage. And if, if I could, I'd just set the stage for that. Um, that environment, it's important to kind of visualize, at least to me, it's an interesting to sort of visualize what it would have been like after World War II in Hollywood. I mean, it was a, um, it was like Silicon Valley, a tech center, and technology was booming there after the war. Um, there were many companies um, that, at, that supported the war effort, um, and then after the war was over, those companies looked for um, another avenue uh, for their um, engineers uh, that were were there. Um, one of those companies was Ampex um, that first made uh, 
uh, engines and motors for the war effort and then um, transitioned into music and video and a whole bunch of other things after that. Um, so let, when Les set up this uh, recording studio in the garage, um, it wasn't just that he's in the back of his house. If you think about the Hollywood community, uh, all of the movie stars that were there, um, it was the center of radio. In walking distance were um, celebrities uh, of both radio and, and film and uh, is just a very um, rich artistic environment. And, you know, Les could walk in to the houses of, of those people. And, and as Gene's pointing out, people would come over to, to his house um, and end up in the studio. Um, so in, in that neighborhood uh, in Hollywood, um, were some notable uh, recording engineers and just electrical engineers that Les was friends with. Uh, one nearby was Wally Jones, who made some uh, very significant equipment for Les. Um, you know, maybe we'll get into that at, at some point, maybe not today because we're focusing on some of the music in the garage and that might come a little bit later. Um, but uh, there were some other people that lived nearby that he was friends with, Jack Mullins, who had brought the tape machine back from, uh, from Germany after the war. And that tape machine was the model for which Ampex made their uh, professional model 200A. Um, it was also the model for another engineer, Colonel Ranger, uh, who made his tape machine, uh, the Ranger phone. And Bert Berlant, who was also a good friend of Les's, who made his uh, tape machines, the Berlant uh, Concertone. So Les, Les was friends with all of these, these um, people. And then he was also part of a, a, a technical group in Hollywood called the Hollywood Sapphire Club which is a group of audio engineers that included people like Jim Lansing, um, who really paved the way for, you know, large speakers and audiophile type equipment and um, recording studio equipment. So here he is in this environment and um, he's making music. He's working um, on radio shows. He works with uh, Groucho Marx on his radio show with Bing, um, with, just a number of, of radio shows and he's busy. He's busy recording, he's at the recording studios um, and he's also working in his own recording studio. Um, so in his studio, he really begins to experiment, um, searching for a new sound. And uh, you know, I've heard, uh, we, we talk about this term that you've heard called sound on sound, um, which is more than just overdubbing, but I've heard this term used in several different capacities. So some, will, some articles or some materials or even in interviews with Les, he'll refer to Sound on Sound as the early music with the record lathes. And then other people I've heard will refer to Sound on Sound as the music made with the Ampex 300 tape machine with the fourth tape head. So I'm curious to know from those that are here if Sound on Sound can be, uh, if that term applies to the earliest music, um, the music like Brazil and Lover that he was making with um, the record cutting lathes. Um, but in my research, I had encountered there are four different approaches, distinct approaches to sound on sound. He starts with the record cutting lathes about 1947 um, and until about 1950 makes music with the record cutting lathes. And then in 1950, um, Bing drops off a uh, Ampex 300 tape machine and Les puts a fourth tape head in there so that he could use that to travel to continue to do his own radio shows and also make recordings on the road as his, uh, his, his and Mary's uh, performing schedule was very active at that time. So they needed something to travel with. Um, so there was that as the second sound on sound um, period. And then shortly after that, he realized it was just too cumbersome to make um, music on this machine, because if you make a mistake on that machine, everything is ruined and you didn't have the advantage that you had with the earlier method with the record cutting lathes. So he picks up another Ampex tape machine and then he ends up traveling with both of those tape machines doing sound on sound the way he did previously with the two tape machines or record lathes, excuse me. 
And then finally, uh, the fourth period is once he and Mary move out to Mawa and uh, build a studio, record, beautiful recording studio in their home. Um, they were doing sound on sound with two Ampex tape machines, two Ampex 300 tape machines that were set up just for that purpose. And this all predates the eight track. In a way it leads to the eight track, but it predates it. And if you go back and listen to the recordings, there's different nuances with each of these methods. And there's different equipment and different experimentation and different things uh, that you'll not only hear, but that he did in trying to get everything just right. It was like he was continuing to chase after that sound. <clears throat> so maybe I'll just leave it there and I'll, um, I'll let someone else talk. Well, maybe I'll jump in a little bit. Uh, this is Frank Rush. I'll jump in a little bit about the, the tape recorders and the background. Um, when Bing Crosby jumped in there, uh, it was at the end of the war and, and Ampex, of course, was looking for something to do. And uh, the, the tape recorder was brought to them um, and they had an investor and Bing Crosby Enterprises uh, also came as an investor. And uh, what happened is that Bing Crosby bought 60 units of the first tape recorders at the phenomenal price of $4,000 each. Now think about that in the 40s, $4,000 a piece for tape recorders, he bought 60. Eventually ended up buying over 112 because Bing Crosby Enterprises was one of the first quote unquote dealers of Ampex tape recorders and, and sold them off to other people. Um, and in fact, did sell off some of the first ones they got to, um, to ABC, uh, to American Broadcasting Company, DECA, and, uh, and a couple of the others. Uh, the first prototype cost Ampex about $76,000 to build. So Ampex did, did pretty good on that. Um, and of course, after that was the, the, the 300. They built the, the, um, the 200 uh, for a while. Uh, but the sound on sound um, is um, uh, one of those areas that, that Ampex worked with Les. Uh, they, took, they took some of the ideas that Les had um, and they developed um, a product, what they called was cell sync. Uh, and that was a term that, that Ampex applied to it. Simply stated, what it did was, it was a combination of electronics and head technology that allowed us with a switch to simply switch the playback function from the playback head to the center head, which is the record head. And in the recording process, you have three heads, the erase, record, and the playback in that order. And so simply with cell sync, we switched the playback to the record head. So at that point, you can listen and record at the same instant on the same head. And when at the, at the ending days of Ampex uh, of 24 track capability where they were cramming 24 tracks on two inch tape, it was demanded by the talent and, and Ampex responded. Um, the the, the uh, technology was such that the frequency response was above 20,000 Hertz on the, uh, the playback off the record head and signal noise. I can't remember what it was, but it was just as good or better as the playback head. So anyway, it was a cell sync. It was a term um, that, that, you know, was based on it by, by Ampex. Um, it was, and of course it was an engineer at, uh, at Ampex who actually uh, took the idea, ran with it and came up with the technology to apply it to the, to the multi-track tape recorders and later in later times, it was uh, just kind of a normal thing on, on all of our tape recorders, even on a, on a Monaro, not that it worked, did anything, but uh, it was on the Monaro electronics. But uh, even from a two track right on up to the, to the 24s, cell sync was, was a permanent fixture. So um, it all started back with just less and an idea. And, uh, and of course, Ampex went on to develop the video tape recorder and many other uh, recording devices uh, for the federal government and, and so forth. And um, there, there's now a, a probably 
less than 50 people in a company called Ampex that's making some specialized little device, I think, for the federal government. And that's about the end of the company. So um, anyway, that, that's kind of the audio part of it. Questions? So, so coming out of California, what were some of the innovations that um, that less uh, perfected in Cal in the, in the California studio? I, I thought that's up to you, Gene. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, the echo, the <laughs> delay was interesting. Uh, he was always looking for glue. Uh, by taking his guitar, uh, he always took it direct, well, most of the time. Uh, and when he did that, he came up with a very uh, isolated sound. You eliminated the room, atmosphere, those kind of things. So when he got into the multiples, he was really curious on how to glue it together, how to make it sound like an orchestra. Now, back in those days, they kept the orchestra in one room. Today, they record everybody in different rooms. But back then, they really paid attention to the fact that there was something happening between musicians and that that sound, that harmonic sound, is what he was looking for. And he told the story many times that uh, he was in a, a, a saloon with his buddy and they were having some dinner or something, hot dog, whatever. And he was trying to explain uh, to his buddy, I think it was Lloyd, what he was looking for. And, and his way of describing it was like, if you go to the Grand Canyon and you say hello, you can hear it go, hello, hello, hello. And Lloyd, just off the cuff, said to him, well, that's like if you were cutting something and you put the playback head right after it, you would get that repeat, right? <laughs> and dad said, we're leaving. And they left the saloon, went back to the studio and tried it. And that's where the delay came from. The echo, one perfect example of the echo was when they did How High the Moon now, I'm sure it came before that, but this is a great example. Again, glued. They were in Jackson Heights recording How High the Moon, and they started and had to stop because they could hear airplanes go over, sirens. They were, they were in a, a hotel type thing. And even though you could remotely record anywhere with this tape machine, um, that was because some of the other problems you had. So he figured, okay, take Mary with a 44, which is a gigantic mic, and put her under a blanket or two, depending on how much noise there was. And when he did that, it worked perfect. He isolated her away from the other noises, and they're ready to record except for the fact that now she had the glue problem because now there's no atmosphere. She's in an adequate chamber of blankets and it was real dead and there was no life to it. So he figured out to take and put a speaker and a microphone out in the hallway and one of them in a bathroom. And depending on the spacing, the timing of it, he'd move one of the, the microphone he'd move, not the amp, but he'd move the microphone to fit what he was looking for in the glue department. And when he did that, he would send her vocal out there, then bring the echo back in, 
and mix it with the, the live vocal. And this is where he came up with the <laughs> echo, the idea of the echo. Uh, most of the things that he came about with had to do with the music. Uh, all of his inventions had to do with him performing and his records. There's only one invention that had nothing to do with that. And that was the eight track. That's the only one that he didn't use. And it was a gift to the next generation because he knew how difficult it was to work with disc to disc and sound on sound with the tape machine with the fourth head. He knew, he even said, he, he, I've, I've heard the story told by him and I had to verify it when I was putting the website together because he said that you'd have to be stupid to do what I did. <laughs> but he said, I had an idea and I had to get it on something. And if he would have had Pro Tools back then, he would have used that. <laughs> he would have made it work. It, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, the equipment. It, the equipment was very important, and he studied it because he knew that if he layered things, they would change by the time he finished the record. So the bottom end was the biggest problem. Uh, with the basic mix, because if you put a bass on relatively first and like high the moon, they put on 24 parts. Well, maybe it wasn't 24 times they recorded, but let's say it's 20. By the time you get done with this, the frequency response starts to interrupt the mix. So it became very interesting how he would pick the parts he would start with. And that became more of an interest to me after I started to work at Atlantic Records because two things bothered me. One thing bothered me was how did he get the sound he got in the garage? We have some of the best equipment at Atlantic Records and I'm sitting there and I can't get it. Same microphones, I can't get it. So I end up at two o'clock in the morning, knock on dad's door and we're up all night and he's bringing down these transcripts and, and discs and stuff. And we're listening to the garage and talking about miking and keeping things out of the line. He didn't like compressors. He didn't like limiters. Uh, matter of fact, there's a wild story with Ryan Norma about the Fairchild, which was very interesting. And dad never took credit for the Fairchild, but when Ryan was working with dad, with the console that married to the A-Track, Ryan asked him, he said, well, uh, I don't see a limiter around. I don't see a compressor. What's with that? And he said, I don't like them. And Ryan said, well, what don't you like? And they sat down and talked about it in, in the kitchen, <laughs> as normal, the conference table. They would sit there all night talking about it. And Ryan went out and got a whole bunch of parts and stuff and they ordered them and they were all set to build it. And who comes over but Fairchild? And all of a sudden, everybody's introduced and the next thing dad knows, Ryan's working for Fairchild. And lo and behold, they finished the console. Everybody was happy with that. And Fairchild came out with his limiter, compressor, which is the holy grail of compressors. Nobody gave into any credits or anything, but I know that Dad was more of a inquisitive guy that would ask the questions, why can't you do this or that? 
And when he did that, it motivated a lot of people. It motivated Gibson. Gibson, less than, Dad didn't create the Gibson guitar. He created the pickups and the idea, and they put it together. He didn't create the eight track, but he came up with the wish. He came up with the concept of it that said, we got to do something because this is the way to record, but it ain't with this equipment. It's not disc to disc. It's not a mono tape machine with a fourth head that, that when you play your previous part and add it, you lost the previous part. You only have what you just did, not what you did before. So it became a catch-22. But he knew that. And when he said, you'd have to be crazy to do what I did, that was the key to he had something in his mind and in his heart he wanted to do musically. <laughs> and that was the closest thing he had around him to do it with. Okay, I have a, uh, a question from Steve Lucas. Steve, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, I heard Gene mentioning um, the way he put parts down and the order of, of, of those parts. But I was having a conversation with Les one night and he said something very interesting in that how he used the guitar for the bass parts and he played it. And uh, I thought that even the register of the guitar, well, that would give him more physical space and it would be easier to control than uh, a, a, a string bass or electric bass that was a whole octave lower and bigger and tougher to control even uh, the needle in the groove. So I wonder if Gene could elaborate on that. And then there's one other thing I wanted to mention that I don't think is mentioned very often. There's a video on YouTube where Les and Lou and the guys are at the Edison facility. And while they're there, they get into a discussion and Les mentions how with tape speed, he helped to invent something as fun as the chipmunks. <laughs> Absolutely. The first thing with, with the bass is, 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 is I, I love you, Steve. <laughs> it's, it's, a great, it's a great question and I, I, I pondered over it because one day at Atlantic Records, or it wasn't Atlantic, it was at uh, uh, our mastering place in New York. Uh, my buddy came in to me, Joel Kerr, he's in with this somewhere. And he came to me and he said, you won't believe what we got the master. And I'm like, okay, you know, you want me to guess all day? What is this? And he said, your dad. And okay. Lo and behold, I got Dad and Mary's album to, to master. So I'm sitting there and I'm listening to it and I'm sitting there laughing. And Joe walks in and he says, what's so funny? I said, this son of a bitch, when he did Lover, he did it with an upright bass, I believe. And after that, he didn't. And Steve, that's exactly why he played the bass on his guitar, for two reasons. One, an upright bass has way too many harmonics and not enough fundamental. And as you know, when time progressed and the Dan Electro came about, that was too skinny. So they had to double it with an upright and that to really pull it off. And the Dan Electro covered the small speaker and the upright bass covered a good high five. Dad <laughs> would sit there and put his bass on because it held no matter where you played it, you heard the bass. The other thing he did, which blew me away, is I was sitting him with him one night and he was overdubbing a bass on something with the eight track. And I'm sitting there watching him and he had on his console, he had three meters, a left, right and a center. And okay, it took me a while to figure out why, but that's what he did. 
But he would put the base in the center track of the VU. The only thing on that track was a base. And he'd be playing the bass, and he'd say, I got to go back and do that again. And I said, why? It sounds great. It was uneven. Well, I'm looking at him. Well, you got a compressor over here. You got the Fairchild over here. What's, and he said to me, no, 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 no. I don't like them. They take out my expression. Okay, great. So I'm watching them. And again, I'm a young kid that by the time I left the studio and home, went to Atlantic Records and then retreated back to the house to figure out some of these things that I couldn't figure out <laughs> and started to remember what he was doing. What he did with the center meter is he would play the bass and as he played it, he would watch the meter. And if a note was short, he'd go back and do it again, knowing that note he had to play a little louder. And he would level it out without using a compressor or a limiter. Didn't he call that ride the gain? <laughs> no, he didn't ride. He ride the pick. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it blew me away because he would always record watching the meter. Because he, he had the compressors. He didn't like them because they took the feeling away from what he was doing. You got to remember, he came from, when he recorded with Bing, I asked him the question. I said, how many takes? He says, one. <laughs> I said, you got to be kidding. That is an icon record, without a doubt. That's the greatest solo he ever played in his life. And, and probably one of the greatest records that Bing ever sang. And Bing, he said, I admired Bing because Bing would sacrifice perfection over the human honest element that came out of his voice. And it attached to his playing. Because when he worked with Fred Warren, with, with all of the live performances with uh, the armed forces, all of these things were all live. So to him, the live world was mother nature. So when somebody would say to him, well, okay, you claim it's stupid to do what you did with the sound on sound, but why, when you were asked the question, you have the eight track now, you know what sound on sound was with the mono machine with the fourth head. Tell us what you feel now. And in the interview, he said, I had more fun with sound on sound. You, you've uh, mentioned that he didn't like compressors. Um, did he do any post recording processing? Did he, did he want to reproduce the sound of the instrument and therefore he did all, all the manipulation with pickup design and that sort of thing? Or did he just, um, did he tinker with the sound afterwards um, electronically? Uh, speaking now of back on the sound and sound in the garage? Well, just any recording, um, you know, an inventor like him, he could have invented uh, any of the effects boxes that guitarists use now uh, or, or things like um, the, the post-processing, pitch adjust, adjustment and everything. Was, was he involved? Pitch adjustment, pitch adjustment, delays, all of that stuff were his glue. And when you talk about, uh, uh, you were talking about the chipmunks, that was him coming up with, he, he, he would say that before he recorded, back with sound on sound. And it was interesting, but by the time he got to the A track, he didn't like the A track, okay? For him, he knew this was the future, but you had to be a virgin to work with A track. You can't come from the past and say to Bing Crosby, well, we got A track, we can overdub your voice now. He'd tell you to go away. So when he, when he took and did these things, um, he, he really 
wanted to create something so special, so different. And when he got to the disc to disc, he figured out that he could change the, the speed and, and alter the sound, meaning he would have to play it totally different in order to make it come back right. But all of these things had to do with music. And he was so far into, one day he said to me, he said, you know something, if everybody learns what I did, nobody's gonna duplicate it. And that's the God's truth. He said that to me one day, because what he did came from his soul. He had this inside of him. And what I was saying before, before I got off on a tangent, was he knew the song before he recorded it. And today, you don't have to know the song title for six months. So his concept of recording is, I work it all out. I know what I'm going to do. There will be little variances that will go on. Same thing with Mary. He sat with Mary. Mary knew nothing about the tunes. Nothing. He would bring her in the room and she'd say, what do you want me to do? And he would say, well, I figure four-part harmony on this one. Okay? So sing the fourth part first. And in layering, when it came to the vocal, she would sing the fourth part first. Because he not only, and she not only, had to perform it, but he had to mix it live. He had no way to come back to it. Today, we have the luxury to mix a tune for 10 years <laughs> and never get it right or be satisfied. Back then, it was instinct. So he had to layer Mary voices where, A, she had to sing the fourth part, then the third part, and the last parts they put on was the bass, the lead guitar, and her vocal. And how he'd start the tune out was more lunacy. He would start it out with the most insignificant part he could mm -hmm. find, something that gave you a minor chord structure, the time, and that was it and the frame of the tune. Then he would add a percussion on his guitar or whatever and slowly build this. Now, how he built it, you would have to only go back to vinyl uh, acetates because tape is gone. Each part's gone. <laughs> so that's, that's not something you can analyze. However, Sean, I don't think if you know this, but let me throw it out and you tell me if you know it. He had to put together the live concert. The live concert is all the hits. What did he make it on? John, did you hear that? How did he make the, the live concert on? How did he make the live concert? Oh, you know, okay. I, let me tell you what yeah, okay. it was. Okay? <laughs> he couldn't go back to disc and he couldn't go back to tape because on the live concert, which I played on stage with him for years, he had no lead vocal, no lead guitar and a supplementary rhythm she played live. All of those tapes have to be made with the A-track. Now, I don't think one of them have been archived. And stupidly, when the tape machine was up at Dad's house before they tore the house apart, all those tapes should have been transferred on the machine it was made on. And that is sitting up there. 
Now, I'm not sure it's on the 8th. I came in after the live show with the tape for his concerts. But I was thinking about it, and I'm saying to myself, he had to record the whole damn thing all over again. Mm -hmm. Where is that tape? So if you want an adventure, you're going to find out each part he put on, not in the interval. Disc is the only way to find the interval. And good luck, because lovers got to have a million discs. Right. And he probably sucked at chronologically putting everything together. <laughs> you know, so it's going to be a guess when you're done. But what he did with the multi-track to put the live show together has always been an interest in my mind. And I've never been able to get anywhere in the vicinity of it. So seeing you're the one digging, uh, that's my Woodbury message for you. Didn't that wind up in the Library of Congress? It sure did. Everything did. All of the archives is there. What it's doing, I have no idea. But the archives is what proves what dad did between the time his mother said, Lester, you ought to get a sound that I can recognize, and the multiples. That gap is when he experimented. And he experimented in that gap where he actually worked on artists that were picked up by labels. And when the labels spent time with the artists and went back to cut their next album, they didn't do it with Dad. Dad was off in Jabib. He was a star now. So he went over to a studio in town and recorded them. And it didn't sound good. His sound is what they bought. So how he came up with Close Mikey, how he came up with this sound that Bing Crosby loved enough to want to buy him a building, this sound he was so respected for is sitting in the archives. And what the hell it's doing there, I have no idea. It's got no commercial value. The only value it has is a value to show what he did for a year and change looking for his final new sound. That was the period that changed miking, changed echo, delays, phase, all of these things. And it all had to do with the fact that this poor guy wanted to get on stage and perform. That's what it was all about. Gene, didn't he control all of that live with the pulverizer and the decks behind the stage? All that was is a remote control. It, it's what they do now. Yeah. I, I went to see uh, uh, one, one of the Broadway shows, and they had 500 CD players and a big box that locked everything together and programmed the timing. That's what he did. But he did it back then, and... I was on stage with him, and I, after I got through stage fright and got through being able to play my solo and play the show right, I watched Dad, and I was amazed at the audience. I don't care if you had Sinatra before Dad, if you had Basie, if you had, I don't care who it was. Dad would walk out there and marry and absolutely blow the show away. Mm. His unique sound was so spectacular and people would challenge him. They would challenge him. And I said to Dad one day coming off the stage, I said, Dad, I said, what do you do when you go out on stage? And he says, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, you go out there. I said, how do you focus? What, what, what do you do? 
oh, he says that. I said, yeah. He says, I picked the most unbelieving guy or gal in the room. <clears throat> and by the end of the show, I want to see them absolutely knocked out. And he says, that's what I do out there. Gene, I have a couple of questions that came in. Sure. Um, just a little bit more specific. Could you talk a little bit about the very high guitar lines on Sound on Sound? Well, Sean, you have a, you got to probably have more technical uh, snooping than I have. Yeah, yeah. I, I can change speed and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, you know. So with, um, with the, the record cutting wave, when he's doing the high parts, I, it, it's really, he's cutting, sets his record lathe at 33 and a third and cuts at 33 and a third speed, which means you have to play, uh, I think it's a major 10th below. So it's not an octave below the way it would be on the tape machine. So if you, if you, if you switch your speeds on the tape machine, you go from directly, you know, 15 inches per second to seven and a half inches per yeah. second. It's exactly an octave. But on the record cutting lathe, to go from 78 to 33 and a third is about a major tenth away. So, um, so he would play a song. Didn't hold him back, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> so with Lover, for example, um, the, the high part in Lover is the first part that he recorded. Um, so when it opens up with the, the really, really high guitar part, that's the very first part he recorded. And he had to record the high parts first because you get a higher fidelity at 78. Um, and that was the standard format at the time. So it made sense for all the other parts to be recorded at 78. So if you recorded the first one at 33, took that disc, put it to the other, it's either a lathe or a turntable. He used right. two different lathes. I um, think the second lathe came later. Okay, yeah. So then he put it, put it on the other turntable, played it back at 78 and recorded the second part at 78. Now the second part of Lover, which is the fast part, that has three high parts. So all those three high parts were report, recorded first at 33 and a third. And then once they were on the disc, then that, those parts together were played back at 78. The last thing, and this is unique for Lover and the songs that have the band with them, the last thing that was recorded was the band. So they were recorded and uh, Les's lead guitar part were recorded together with the band. So the bass, the drums, and that lead guitar part are mixed in with the high parts at, uh, you know, sped up to seven. Now, when you say the band, yeah, you're talking about what? Uh, in Lover, it's it's just bass and drums. Drums, and, okay, yeah. Um, there are a couple songs that have piano. Um, I can probably get the song name out for you if I dig for it a little bit. Um, but yeah, but after, it, it was maybe about four or five songs that he actually used a, a band on. And then after that, okay, yeah, it's, um, what song used piano? Then after that, it was just guitars. Yeah, it was a growing period, an experimental period yeah. there. You know, right. Very yeah. successful, but he really found his own after that. Right. By the time he got to Mary, he knew what it was. He knew the combination. Yeah. Another question. Um, how did the garage influence the studio he helped construct beneath Capitol Records? I can talk a little bit about this because um, I went to Capitol. The rumor with Capitol Records is that um, when they built the Capitol Records building in that studio, um, which was around 1955, and, and Les had already left Hollywood by this point. He was in Mawa, um, but still with Capitol Records. He was one of the stars at Capitol at that time. Um, when they built the studio, uh, they supposedly asked him and a, a few other engineers to help design the echo chambers. Um, there are four echo chambers that are underneath the parking lot at Capitol. 
Um, you can't access them. You can't get into them. There's like a manhole that you have to climb through in order to get into. They don't let anybody into it, but I saw the manhole at least, but they wouldn't let me into the studio. Um, they were very nervous. I'm sorry, they wouldn't let me into the echo chambers. I did get into the studio. They were very nervous about talking about this um, legend. Um, they didn't want to confirm that it was true. However, there's a big book that was released a couple years ago about Capitol Records and its origins that Capitol commissioned. And the legend is in that book. And, you know, I don't have, maybe Gene, you can tell, you can speak to this. I don't have that many accounts, if any, of less talking about those echo chambers. I think that the rumor came from Capitol themselves or the legend came from Capitol themselves and not necessarily from Les. Gene, did he ever talk about that? No. Yeah. No, he, what he did talk about is he admired the hell out of the European echo. Mm. And he, I said, what? Because he had his own echo chamber in Mawa mm -hmm. and it was phenomenal. Uh, and, and it was really, really good, but he was, Again, the, the guy was crazy in the sense that whatever he focused on, he was gone. You know, uh, I mean, he would he would dive in so deep on something that uh, you, you'd really have a hard time holding on, you know. But he told me one day, I said, what is it with, with Echo? What What's a real Echo, the best Echo you ever heard? He said, uh, a silo. I said, what? He said, a silo. He said, you see a farm with a big silo. He says, oh, Germany, they would take and have a speaker at the bottom and a microphone on a pulley at the top. And they just lower it, up it, depending on what time you wanted to have the echo. And he said the silo, for some reason, gave birth to a wedding of strings of music that was just delicious. He loved that. And that's part of what he tried to get with his echo chamber in the house with the studio. But, but he, I, I never heard him. I never, I heard a lot of people talk about his involvement with the, with the echo chambers at Capitol, but I never, I, I never heard anything conclusive that I could say it came from him, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the, however, I got to say this, the, the Ampex, Frank, the Ampex 8 track was not the first multiple multi-track recording dad ever made. You know what the first one was? Do not. The player piano. <laughs> he referred to that so many times because he said, I had two things. I had something to punch the holes in to create the new note. And I had a piece of tape to put over the hole when I didn't want the note anymore. <laughs> and that was, he relates that to the A track. But that was his, it, it's funny how these little things pop up and come back that you look at and you say to yourself, well, where did this come from? You know, where did he get the idea of the A track? Because what he was doing had nothing to do with that. He had, and what's funny is, I caught him one day, we were doing, he was doing a recording and we were together. And I had to go out in the kitchen and do some help out there. And I went and did that and, and I went to call dad in for dinner and he, he looked like he was fatigued, you know, which is not him. And he came out, we sat, had dinner, everything. Is it going to go back and record? Yeah, great, I'll come with you. And we went back in again. And he sat there, and he went over a part. 
uh, didn't like it, went back again, recorded it again, finally stopped. And I said, what's wrong? I said, this isn't like you. He says, it's just not the same. I said, what do you mean it's not the same? He said, it isn't the same as what I had with sound on sound. He said, sound on sound made me have good discipline. I had to know the song. I had to know what parts I'm going to do with what. And I had to know what Mary was going to do before she walked in the room. He said, it's the discipline I miss. And he says, I have to learn to get that back. Now that, again, was, you know, there's a period of time in your life where you're a sharp tack and you really have whatever you're doing, you're at the top of your game. And certainly in the 40s and 50s, he was at the top of his game. Before the 40s, he was working on it. And I would say by the time he got to 55, 60, uh, 1960 and there, he was now out of it. You know, he could do the show, he could play, he could do all of his things, but that, that thing that he had back with Sound on Sound, the, the, the benefit he had was the restriction he had. He did not have what we have today. You've got everything at your beck and call today. You name it, it can be rolled in the room and you've got it. But what he possessed back there was the key to the vault. He had the key. He knew the song. He knew what he wanted to do. And it was just a matter of what am I going to implement it on? And that was the magic of what this guy did. Another question um, goes back to the uh, Capitol Echo Chambers. If nobody could see the, uh, the Capitol Echo Chambers, how do you think Universal Audio recreated the digital version plugin? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, they weren't just they weren't letting me in there. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I'm sure Universal Audio, Audio got in there. I mean, if you think about Universal Audio, that, that company was started in the 1950s by Bill Putnam, who was the pioneer of echo chambers. So when Capital- One of dad's favorite guys. Yeah, just a, you know, a legend in the, in yep. the audio recording uh, world. Um, so uh, Capital owed a lot to Universal Audio and, and their legacy. So it did make sense for Universal to do that. Um, so I'm sure Universal got in there. You yeah, know, you can, it's possible to get in there. They got to get in there to service it. They got to like climb down a ladder. But so their engineers can get in there. Um, so I interviewed uh, Al Schmidt regarding the chambers. I did not interview Al Schmidt. I couldn't get to him. Um, I interviewed some other people at um, Capitol about them. Um, one person said that, you know, when Les um, came out, um, I think it was maybe for the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award or something like that. One of the major awards that he got, um, you know, late, later in his life, he, he was out in Los Angeles and uh, he did do a tour of uh, Capitol. And it said that he, he said uh, when he was on the tour to the engineers there that um, he told them to, that they should have echo chambers when they build this studio. So it could be that from, from his own recollection that it was that simple, that he simply told the chairman of Capitol that they need, if they're gonna be building that studio, they need echo chambers. And then the legend, I don't know. Who knows how, <laughs> how it got started, but it could be as simple as that. But I will say about the echo chamber gene that you mentioned at, at the house in Mawa, if you listen to the recording Lesson Mary, the, it's the orange co cover, right, yeah. I think of as, I mean, I think that is Les's, Lesson Mary's Sergeant Pepper. It's like the most beautifully recorded 
album with such intricate use of the technology and parts yeah. and musicality. It sounds incredible. And you hear that echo chamber on it. It sounds beautiful. Oh, it was used. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's interesting what he did because uh, he, he, it was all the seat of his pants. It was all what he felt. You know, and I didn't realize this growing up because growing up, I just felt as though every dad had a studio, every dad made his own guitar and, you know, an eight track. Yeah. So uh, not until I got on the stage and realized the coupling between the artist and the, and the inner and the audience, did I understand there was more going on. You know, um, but as I grew up and had time, and even now, I mean, I'm learning things now about my dad I didn't know. Like, he never played uh, any of the early jazz stuff in the house. I never knew anything about, yeah, I heard stories about him playing with Tatum and Lester Young and these guys, but I never heard his jazz performances back then. He would not play him. So it became another one of those strange events where I got a mastering job to do another one, not with Mary, but just dad. And it was his old jazz stuff. That's the first time I ever heard it. So I sat there listening to it and it was incredible because his early jazz stuff was where he ended up on the multiples. You can listen to How High the Moon, the jazz performance of it, and you can see the intent of how these guys played together and where it evolved into How High the Moon, the finished product. So he had the idea in his head. He just didn't call on it until he got there. And then he would refer back to that, and that's part of what Dad played jazz on all of his records. And jazz was anti-Christ back then <laughs> with anybody who was dealing with pop music. If you mention the word jazz, you know, in the 60s, in the 50s, it was like, okay, you know, a distance. But it was jazz he was playing. So it's really interesting, the, the more I grew up and learned more and more about this guy, the more, like I, I, everybody talks about dad as being uh, an inventor first. And that's interesting because that's a big part of his life. But that's not why he invented him. He invented him because he wanted to perform. That's what he wanted. And, and I, I know that because I sat behind him on stage, I watched him and he loved to perform. And if you ever had a chance to see him down at the Iridium or Fat Tuesdays, it's over. You know the guy loved to perform. And that was the toughest thing for him to do was to come out of retirement and go back to that because he knew the arthritis was not going to treat him well and, and he was going to have the audience suffer because of that. So he knew that. But he also knew that was his blood. Without playing a guitar, his life was over. And he knew that. And Bucky knew that. Lou Paolo knew that. You know, they all knew it. And, and they finally talked Dad into going back in. And when he went back in, Fat Tuesdays, he could play. He could really play. And when he got to the Iridium, it caught up with him. But then he'd sit there and tell stories. Or he would do something that most performers don't do, and that is invite everybody up. And when he did that, he shared the spotlight with everybody and gave them their dues. And it was just 
That's who this guy was. Well, now it's about 8.15. I think this is a good time to wrap it up. So again, I want to thank Gene, Frank, Sean. Uh, this was really a, a really great conversation. And we're going to do this again. We're going to probably do this again back in, uh, I think, December we talked about. Uh, we're going to open it up to a wider audience. You know, we're going to make it more public. You know, this was an invitation only. So um, again, thank you all for joining us and uh, see you soon. Awesome.